Greetings! My name is Dan. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Welcome to Ginghamsburg Church. If you're new to Ginghamsburg today, text NEW to the number on the screen and we'll text you right back with a new guest connection card. Look, life can be hard sometimes. We're here to help. Whether it's parenting or life skills or hooking you up with food or clothing, you're in the right place. No matter how you came to us today, everyone has a seat at the Ginghamsburg table. What we'll do first today is sing a few songs, then I'll be back to give you some tantalizing, intriguing, fascinating information, and then at whatever campus you're visiting today, you'll get to hear an encouraging word from one of our pastors. This is part three of a series called Home is the Hub. It is what it sounds like. We're asking ourselves what it means to shift the center of ministry from church buildings to our homes. If that sounds like something you'd like to stick around for, well then let's sing a few songs together and get ourselves ready for the conversation.
time, one voice, Christ alone. Christ alone. He's Lord. Come on and think of his goodness. Amen. Again, welcome to Ginghamsburg Church. As promised, I have some tantalizing, intriguing, fascinating information to share with you. I mean, it's nothing earth shattering, but we always reserve this window of time during worship to share things that we think would be valuable to you. Like, did you know 
Ginghamsburg has a preschool and child care center. Just this week, we celebrated preschool graduation. Year after year, caring for these little ones is one of the most effective ways we reach new young families. And you remember celebrating Mother's Day just a couple weeks ago? And you remember the Mother's Day flower sale? Well, you all went nuts and bought a bajillion flowers, enough to raise over $3,000 in mission scholarships for our students this summer. If you have middle or high school students, get them signed up for the upcoming Dayton Mission Experience. Experiences like these can influence your kids in ways that you'll be happy about. We know that parenting is hard, so let us take your kids for a few days and see what happens. Two other quick reminders. Number one, we have life group leader training in two weeks, and our next Listen and Learn is this Wednesday. If you've never participated in a Listen and Learn, these are simply open conversations about difficult topics from different perspectives. On Wednesday, our friend Chris Wingfield will be sharing a few personal stories and leading a discussion on racism. Tantalizing, intriguing, and fascinating, right? Only possible because you see that God's mission through Ginghamsburg Church is worth investing in. Thank you for your continued mind-blowing generosity. Keep giving like this, and we're going to make a nice little dent in some of the world's biggest problems. You heard it first from me. You can make a difference by setting up a recurring gift today at ginghamsburg.org slash give. Next up, an encouraging word on prayer from the book of Acts. Hey everyone, I'm Rusty and I'm grateful to be with you today. I'm particularly excited about this Home is the Hub series because it really taps into what was going through my wife's and my heart when we moved to Dayton 11 years ago. We had been heavily influenced by a group of Jesus followers in Atlanta who emphasized moving into a neighborhood on purpose and becoming the kind of hub that we're talking about in this series. And so we did that and that's what we've been trying to do in our own neighborhood home for the last decade. A few years ago in that journey, a funny thing happened. A car wash moved in next door to our house. Now, the funny part of that is that the physical structure next to our home is simply another little house with a one car detached garage. There's nothing particularly car washy about it. It didn't take us long to realize that the car wash was a cover for another creative side hustle our neighbors were running. Proof of this came when the car washes became shorter and shorter and the customers seemed to come at all times of the day and night. Over the course of a year, it became evident that there were multiple illicit activities going on at the car wash, and as that kind of activity goes, drama was soon to follow. From loud music, late into the night, to verbal and physical altercations, to eventually one of the neighbors winding up on my porch all beat up at 5 a.m. one morning, things got pretty intense. Now, I'm always a little nervous to share stories about my neighborhood that could be seen as negative because well, it's my neighborhood. <laughs> and the popular perceptions of it are often rooted in stereotypes, racism, and just a fraction of truth. The reality is that these neighbors, well, they had a story. They had reasons for how and why they wound up running a car wash next to our place. And they too, their beloved children of God, on a journey of redemption, just like you and me. I remember one point when the nonsense had gotten pretty intense. During that season, there were nights when, when I would just put my hands on the inner walls of my dining room toward that house and ask for God's protection, for protection of the people next door or my family, and for the demons of addiction and dysfunction to be removed. I remember trying to toe the line of praying for these sisters and brothers who I knew were God's beloved children and against the spirits that seemed so determined to destroy their lives. Maybe some of you feel the same way. For reasons of your own, the, the, this home hub neighboring thing seems a little scary. You might not have a car wash next door, but between your own fears and the unknowns of where all this might lead, 
You're not even sure where to start. Well, you might be at just the perfect spot. Over the last few weeks, we've all been invited to catch this vision of our homes as the hub for the Jesus movement in the 21st century, and to see that it's not really new, but exactly what the earliest Jesus followers were doing. They, they gathered in homes and let the power of the Holy Spirit flow through them and into the car washes next door. But before we knock on a door or step into our neighbor's backyard, walk our dog with the intentions of meeting our neighbors, we must do something very important. So today, we're beginning to lay out a neighboring strategy that begins with the ancient practice of prayer, the perfect starting point for ensuring that our homes become the best and most life-changing hubs. So open your Bibles to Acts 2.42 and let's pray. God, we need you to speak into our hearts and into our lives today. Our ears are ready to hear from you. Amen. Well, let's read together in Acts 2, beginning at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's the earliest Christians, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Oh my gosh, I love this image. What a beautiful picture of community, of mutual sharing, and of neighborhood impact. It's that verse 42 that's helping form this entire series. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. These early Jesus followers were committed to a daily practice of prayer. It was one of the practices that fueled their early lives together. They looked up to, to ancient prayer champions like Daniel, David, Esther, and Hannah. Jesus himself taught his disciples a prayer, the Lord's Prayer. We spent an entire series unpacking that prayer last fall. Conversation with the divine, it's like the oil that keeps our spiritual engines running because without God moving through us in the power of the Holy Spirit, we're just a club, a community with a lot of good intentions. We can't do this on our own. We can prepare, we can share, but our prayers open our spirits and our neighbor's spirits to God's Spirit. Prayer releases a flow for God to open hearts, heal wounds, and invade broken places. It's this kind of prayer in tandem with the other practices of Acts 2.42 that will break open the doors of the kingdom for so many. Now, for a lot of us, prayer may have looked like saying grace at dinner, or reciting a bedtime poem, or, or sharing requests with our life group. And these all belong. But today's different. I want to offer us a fresh approach to this ancient practice. And it begins with something I'll call stepping into the flow. Today, I'm asserting uh, that prayer isn't simply the words we read, recite, rattle off, or whisper under our breath. The operative image of prayer isn't hands folded. <laughs> Rather, prayer is like stepping into a river that's already flowing. When you pray, you aren't starting the movement of the river. It's been flowing since before anyone can remember. But the ripples uh, that are made now that you're in the water, uh, the stones that shift under your feet, uh, they create a change that affects everything downstream. That word prayer in Acts 2.42 comes from a Greek word prosuke and probably is better translated as the prayers. When the early Jesus followers prayed the prayers, they were stepping into a long-standing tradition of daily prayer. And, and though we don't know exactly what these prayers were, they were likely a set of prescribed prayers rooted in the Jewish tradition, including psalms and, and scriptures and, and liturgies, probably the prayer that Jesus taught them. I have a book that's a modern version of something like what they may have used. It's, it's called Common Prayer. It's a diverse collection of, of prayers and scriptures liturgies, and, and sacred actions. And the cool thing is that people all over the world use this every day. 
Remember, Jesus and his followers, they never set out to start a new religion. Jesus clearly saw himself as the next chapter of a story that had been unfolding since the beginning of time. And so his followers didn't divorce themselves from the story that had gotten them to where they were. They simply stepped into that flow and allowed it to take them to new places in light of their experience with Jesus. And the same is true of our entrance into prayer. When we pray, we too are stepping into a flow of grace and presence and mystery that's long preceded us. God's been working in our lives and in our family's lives and in our neighbor's lives way before this Home is the Hub series or Neighbor Challenge. The flow is already flowing. But that doesn't mean that our stepping into it is insignificant. Our intentional step into the flow of prayer is one of the most powerful things we can do. Maybe you've heard that quote before, prayer isn't the least we can do, it's the most. Now, it's not because prayers like the secret magic trick Jesus followers have up their sleeves for manipulating the heavens into acting benevolently on our behalf. That notion of prayer, although pervasive, is toxic. And quite frankly, it's a setup for doubt and disappointment. Prayer is not, and never has been, about manipulating God to do our bidding. Prayer is the most we can do, because when we pray, we admit, like our friends in recovery have learned, that we are powerless. We've reached our end. We, we need something stronger than our own strength. Sometimes these prayers, well, they seem to change God's mind about things. We pray for a sick baby and the baby's healed. We pray for the money and someone mysteriously sends a check. Coincidences happen that are just too divine to be anything else. Now, sometimes we step into the flow, and we can probably all name times like these, where we come to the end of ourselves and we pray the prayers, and things don't work out like we hoped. God doesn't seem to come through as we'd asked. Perhaps these moments, in these times, prayer is the most we can do because when we pray, our hearts and our eyes and our minds and our perspectives open up to a much, much bigger one. We change when we pray. My own family has experienced this. My dad's had multiple medical events that, that have left him without a sense of balance along with some other neurological issues. His life, my mom's life, our lives have been upended. And at different times, the God-following people in his life have gathered around him and, and my mom, and they've, they've said all the words, and they've said the prayers, and, and they've used the anointing oil, all the things. And dad's balance still hasn't returned. But get this, some of those same God-loving people, Les and Kathy specifically, who were there at those prayer meetings to this day still drive my parents several hours to the hospital. They help keep the grass mowed and the firewood stocked. Les and Kathy have neighbored my parents, and for them, prayer was about far more than recited words or bossing God around. They stepped into the flow and became the answers to their own prayers. Prayer changed them. And things downstream for my folks, are way different because of it. When it comes to prayer, we can't always see what's taking place below the surface. But if we'll step into the flow, we'll discover that the current is powerful. One of the challenges of, of modern prayer, or at least the kind of prayer that I grew up with, is that it usually began with this instruction, bow your head and close your eyes. Any of you experienced that? It's like a reflex for those of us who've been formed in institutional church. If I say, let's pray, you're going to almost instinctively close your eyes. Now, I think it was meant to engender a spirit of humility and focus, which aren't bad. And subsequently, the bow your head moments also served as a great time for parents to flick their kids' ears or snap them up during long church services. But the heart of it was good, right? Let's tune out the noise and focus on talking to God for now. Unfortunately, we often raised our heads, opened our eyes, and assumed that the prayer was over. <laughs> and I fear that we still do this today, like literally today. We, we tune in or show up, sit through worship, and check the prayer box. Or we say our daily prayer at mealtime or a reading on our own or with our family, step away and get on with 
real life. I want to invite you to a different way of praying as you're in your neighborhood this week. Raise your head and open your eyes. Every eye open, every head raised. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 22, that the eye is the lamp of the body. So look around, look around your block, your building, your country square mile. What do you see? Who do you see? Begin to speak God possibilities over those places and people. Remember that, that they're God's beloved on a journey of redemption. Step into the flow and maybe you'll be compelled to go learn their name or see how they're doing, to go clean up that messy corner at the end of the road, to invite that family over for a cookout or for some ice cream. Tell God what you see, what you feel. Ask what God sees and feels about these people and these situations. Look at verse 46 again. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That sounds like a heads up, open eyes experience to me. When we develop a daily rhythm of praying with eyes wide open, with our heads up and, and looking around, it lifts our vision, it ignites our imagination, and anything can happen. Now at this point, you might be thinking, yeah, I can see it, Rusty. I can see the home hub thing. It is a little scary, like Rachel said last week, and, and that flow thing you mentioned, it's a little different, but kind of cool. Opening my eyes, yeah, I can do that. But prayer has always just been what I do at church or what I listen to others do at church or before meals or something. Friend, I hear you. Prayer can be intimidating. But you know what? I bet you're already doing it more than you think. In her book, Help Thanks Wow, Anne Lamott argues that pretty much any prayer can be put into one of these categories, a cry for help, a word of thanks, or a wow of wonder. I might suggest that we can also work backwards <laughs> and that any cry for help, any word of thanks, and any wow of wonder is in fact a prayer. You're already doing it. You might think you're talking to the wind or to yourself or to nothing, <laughs> but God is right there with you. Always has been right here with us. These categories serve as a guide to assist you as you begin to pray for and with your neighbors. As you're walking around doing life, hanging out with your head raised and your eyes open, you may see a need, something that's broken, or a family that seems in distress, or a mean spirit within yourself. And in that moment, you say, God, help. <laughs> help my neighbors struggling to raise their kids. Help Joe down the street as he undergoes those chemo treatments. Help me show love to the bully on our block, or around the corner, down the street, or in apartment 4A. Or when a neighbor cuts your grass or picks up your trash cans that blew over, because you know your neighbors can step into the flow for you too, right? Or when a neighbor grabs the elevator for you as you lug groceries up to your flat, you think, thank you for kind humans. Thank you for seeing me, God. And better yet, you just come right out and say thank you to your neighbor. And it becomes a prayer stepping into the flow, eyes wide open. And, and now that the flower's up and the, the trees are in bloom and, and neighbors are out in their yards playing or working, you say, wow, what a cool place I get to live. What amazing people God has put all around me, each one with a story. And it becomes a prayer. Your life, their life, your story, their story, all part of the God story all part of the flow. When I think about the potential for all of us making our homes little Jesus movement hubs, this is what I see. I see the Miami Valley or other hotspots around the country with hundreds, one day thousands of spiritual champions who embrace the calling to make their home a hub for God's love, who know that we exist to love Jesus and do something about it, who are inviting everyone to the table for faith, for family, and for food. Can you imagine the impact of hundreds of hubs of people who are stepping into the flow with heads raised and eyes open, ready to say, help, <laughs> thanks, wow. I can, I can see it, I can feel it. 
And I think it's what I was trying to lean into those nights with, with my hands on the walls towards my neighbor's house. I was hoping, trusting, pleading that a new creation story would be written in their lives and in mine. I was hoping that no one would get hurt, that the kids in our neighborhood wouldn't get sucked into what appeared to me as a desperate existence, that they would see a different picture and possibility for themselves. I felt powerless, so I cried out, help! And the next day, I'd try to stay in that flow and chat kindly over the fence or listen to a story or ask my neighbors directly but graciously not to sell drugs in front of my kids. Eventually, the car wash closed down and moved on. An answer to my prayer? Who knows? <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll see their chief operations officer and I'll wonder how he's doing. I pray that he is well. So this week, how might you step into the flow and begin to pray in your neighborhood with your head raised and your eyes wide open? As you're mowing the lawn, can, can you talk to God about who and what you see? Can you look around your apartment building and ask God to guide you as you take the neighbor challenge, depending on God for the courage, the words, the time to follow through? And if you don't know how to get started or if you get stuck along the way, just remember, help, thanks, wow. Simple words that can open your spirit, the spirits of those around you, and the spirit of God. In that space, anything can happen. So let's practice today. <laughs> Real quick, heads raised, eyes open, let me pray for you. God, I pray for my friends receiving this message today. I know that you see them, you see their story, you see the stories of their neighbors. I pray that you would invite them into the flow this week, that they would step in to the prayerful flow with you, with their eyes open, with their heads raised, seeing all that's going on around them, saying yes to your work in their lives and the lives of their neighbors. Help our homes become the hub that you want them to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. That's it for today's broadcast. Thanks for remembering that the June food drive is only two weeks away. For June, we're collecting snack supplies, especially things that kids can grab on their own. A lot of the families we serve earn just enough not to receive state help, but don't make enough to afford childcare. So many moms and dads who are working from home have their kids with them during the day. Snack foods would help bridge the gap. Next week, I'll be introducing a new face. We're close to the launch of our new website, and with it, the inaugural days of Ginghamsburg.Church. A new campus means a new campus pastor. Yes, an online campus pastor. And I can't wait for you to meet him. Thanks for liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing, and all that good stuff. It really makes a difference. God loves you. See you next week.